Um, all right. So yeah, I was part of the cave inventory crew in last summer of 2019, along with Penelope Vorster, Zach Engelbert, who I believe is on this meeting and, uh, myself. <clears throat> so I'm not sure how much you guys know about it. Uh, but we got paid to cave, which is everybody's dream, right? <laughs> so, uh, Dan Seifert is the one who created it. Um, and basically we were just ridge walking in the prior mountains and finding and documenting not only caves, but also karst features. Uh, the term cave is a little bit different <laughs> the way we were using it. Uh, we documented all the karst features and the government defines a cave as anything that a human can fit in. Uh, so essentially all of the karst features we found were caves, um, based on that description. Uh, but as you'll see later in the presentation, we only found about five uh, caves of significance. Um, so, and the organizations involved, we worked with the, uh, the Forest Service as well as the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, however, we are hired through the Montana Conservation Corps and GeoCorps. Uh, Zach and myself were Montana Conservation Corps members uh, and Penelope was the GeoCorps member. Uh, so the history of the prior mountain cave crew. So last year there was, a, or the year, I guess two years ago now, there was a cave crew as well in 2018. Uh, Carl, who is on the meeting, was one of those members. Um, and this is somewhat of a continuation of the uh, NCRI's earlier work. So they did a lot of work documenting caves in the priors. Um, and we're just kind of continuing that. Um, and then in 2018, the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto actually won the Forest Service and BLM Joint Conservation Project of the Year, which is pretty cool. Uh, so <laughs> for those of you that don't know, although I believe you all do know, uh, the Prior Mountains are right there where it's circled. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that's central Montana, south central Montana. Um, and it is an area that's uh, managed by the Forest Service, the BLM, the National Park Service, as well as having the Indian Reservation to the north. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of different agencies involved, and of course the wild horse range is there. Uh, so we got to see a lot of the wild horses this summer, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> um, so if you've never been to the Priors, there's kind of two completely different uh, ecosystems in the Prior Mountains. The lower elevations are very arid; it's desert-like, uh, which is that right picture there. It's almost like being in Utah, um, and then the left is a lot of uh, pine forest and meadows which is, it was really cool. Earlier in the season, we spent a lot of time in the lower elevations. Um, and then as the snow melted away and it got warmer, we moved up to the higher elevations. <clears throat> so just a little briefing of the prior mountains. There are 58 known caves currently. I believe that's an accurate number. Uh, the temperatures are generally 32 to 38 degrees. Uh, the deepest of which is Frog's Fault at 261 feet. And the longest is Little Ice Cave at just over 6,000 feet. And of course, there's several other notable caves in the Priors. Uh, Big Ice Cave is a developed recreation site. Mystery Cave is a beautiful cave uh, that um, the Big Fork High School Cave Club actually did a lot of, a lot of restoration work on, as well as uh, developing trails and uh, other things inside the cave. So that's pretty cool. And then Royce Cave. And of course, uh, just across the Bighorn River and the Bighorns are Bighorn and Horse Thief Caves. <clears throat> So Big Ice Cave, for those of you that don't know, is just one, basically one room. There's a lower level, um, but it's gated and you have to get permission to access it in a key. Uh, this is the main room in the upper level with some cool ice formations and there's Zach admiring them. Uh, Mystery Cave as well. So what did we do? We had four days on and three days off, uh, and we spent most of our time uh, in tents at Britain Springs. Um, on our four days on, we were actually camped in tents at Britain Springs, which is a wild horse uh, holding facility um, just outside of Lovell. And that was our base camp, and we used a UTV to go into the priors each day. Um, there was a few weeks that we also stayed on the other side of the priors, uh, just across from the Sage Creek campground in, the, in a Forest Service cabin there. Uh, so here's the Britain Springs facility, which is a lot different than the Sage Creek cabin that we stayed in. <laughs> but both were pretty, pretty amazing and had all the amenities that we needed. <clears throat> so what did we do each day? So we got up around 7 a.m. and we would load our vehicle. Uh, we had a UTV and an SUV. So depending on where we went, we would select the vehicle. 
Um, and we usually drove about 45 minutes to an hour on the miserable roads of the Pryor Mountains uh, to get to wherever we were ridge walking. And then we had ridge walk. Uh, we had a tablet with us, which we used to enter any cars feature that we found. Um, and we used it, uh, several different applications uh, that the BLM had developed for us. Uh, and the format that we had was very similar to the NCRI's format. Um, so it asked us, you know, what kind of cave it is, if it's a cave, if it's a cars feature. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's about three pages of questions in total. So we collected a lot of information on every cars feature that we did uh, collect information on. And then afterward, we would obviously just hike back to the vehicle and head back to camp. Uh, a lot of the previous work was they used satellite imagery and found a lot of pits and a lot of uh, very obvious caves. Um, so a lot of the time we, this summer we, or last summer rather, we spent in canyons. Um, we didn't find too many caves at the bottom of the canyons. However, there were several that we found along the edges and near the mouth of the can or the start of the canyon. <clears throat> Here's just some pictures from our summer walking. Uh, there's some, I mean, it's absolutely, the priors are absolutely gorgeous if you haven't been there. And you can see the drastic difference between the lower and higher elevations there. We saw some bears, <laughs> some other wildlife. <laughs> Uh, we also found some very cool arches and other karst features. Um, the priors really are a very unique area. Uh, this is actually a picture of Rattlesnake Canyon, which was a cool slot canyon that we found this summer. Some awesome fossils. And of course, we had some fun in the UTVs. Uh, this <laughs> Zach was a mushroom. He's very passionate about mushrooms. So this is a puffball mushroom, which we actually took back and cooked up. <clears throat> uh, this is Purple Balloon Cave, which at the very beginning of the summer, we just freshly to Montana jumped into the job and we didn't yet have the data on previously discovered caves. Uh, so we were walking and boom, there's this massive, or, well, it's not massive. It's only, I don't know, it's a 20 to 30 foot drop, but it, a pit in a real cave and we got really excited and you know we returned and we were telling Dan all about it and we soon realized that this was actually an already discovered cave so our first our one of our early finds was not actually a true find <laughs> uh, we attempted twice to get down it to the bottom of Crooked Creek uh, but due to shortage of rope and other difficulties we did not end up getting to the bottom of Crooked Creek uh, so we didn't do any ridge walking in the lower section of Crooked Creek. We did get into the upper section where it's a little, where the cliffs are only, uh, where you can walk down into it in a few of the drainages. Um, but we did not get into the deeper sections of Crooked Creek. Uh, so how did we decide where to walk? So Dan and Jenny uh, in 2017 got a helicopter and actually flew over the priors and marked with GPS uh, any points, any holes that they saw, that they thought would be of interest. Um, so we had basically a tablet with all those G GPS points on it. Um, and we spent the first part of the summer just kind of following those GPS points, running around, trying to find them. And it turned out that a lot of those were just massive rock shelters. Uh, there's a lot of rock shelters in the priors. Um, and we were kind of, the limestone was of questionable quality. And so later in the summer, uh, we actually, we, as we got, more familiar with the different uh, layers of limestone, uh, we kind of based our ridge walking decisions on that. Mm -hmm. So as I just said, there are a ton of holes in the priors. If you've never been there, they are everywhere, but there's not a lot of caves. Um, we did find, or we documented over 200 karst features, uh, most of which, as I said, were just small rock shelters, but there were about 10 to 20 caves between 20 to 200 feet. Uh, notably, we found these five caves, and these are actually the five caves that we nominated for significance, which I'll get into later. Uh, Dusty Hole, Three Bone Cave, Cliff Cave, Bird Ice Cave, and Paint Box Cave. 
So Dusty Hole was our first find of the year. Uh, and it was actually a very, in a very obvious location, only about 20 yards from where we parked our UTV. Uh, we were walking down an old mining road to access a canyon where we were going to ridge walk that day. And I saw a tiny hole on with the picture on the left there, just a, a very, very small hole. And I poked my head down and shined my light in it. And I was like, whoa, it, it opens up in there. Uh, so the next couple, the next day we came back with a, later that week, we came back with a shovel and dug it open just enough for us to get in. And there ended up being about 150 feet of passage. There's us squeezing into our dug open hole. Some pictures. And as you can see, it was very dusty. Um, so the floor, we called it dusty hole because the floor was actually about four inches of just the fluffiest dust I've ever encountered. Um, and later, after squeezing through this, we figured out why there was most likely so much dust. Because there was borehole, not, there was, it was actually an old mine tunnel uh, that intersected the cave. Uh, it looked like they had actually entered the cave and then dug the mine tunnel from the cave. Um, and then, as I said, it was just that tiny hole. And we think what happened is when they built the mining road, they just kind of filled in the entrance to the cave. Um, because when you first go down into the entrance, it's just kind of break down and um, dirt fill. So, uh, but at first, when I first popped through, I was screaming and yelling that we found this amazing massive passage and this was so exciting. And then it ended up, as we got further down, we saw blast marks and realized that it was indeed not a cave, just a mine tunnel. <clears throat> Uh, but th our next find was Three Bone Cave. It's about the same length, but very different in character. It was just a belly crawl. Uh, it had a few small rooms, um, but it had some amazing formations and, of course, three bones. Uh, so the formations were mostly just soda straws, but some of them were quite long. Yeah, so this formation was on the left there was about... It's about a foot long, um, which is pretty cool. All right, our third cave of the year was Cliff Cave, uh, which Zach found. Uh, it's, it has about 60 feet of passage, and at the very end of it, it has some impressive cave formations. Uh, and you have, <laughs> you have to get through an area we called the stripper because it was so tight and sharp that when you went through, you were fine. But when you went back through, you wanted to go legs first, and every time it would pull your shirt up. So it just kind of stripped you. Uh, so this is the entrance. It's just kind of a crouching passage. And then you get to the stripper, which you can see me going through there. Uh, and these are the formations. So it was some mammillary crust, I believe is what it's called, um, also known as cave clouds. Uh, these are some really poor pictures, but they are absolutely amazing and you can see kind of the scale there with Zach standing in front of him uh, this is also the only cave that we have mapped so far uh, so Ben Parker and I went back in September and mapped it so it was 60 feet in length this total uh, our next find was bird ice cave which is a short cave but it is a ice cave so it although it is small it does indeed have ice formations in it um, and some birds uh, nesting in the entrance which freaked us out when we entered as they flew out past us uh, we got there this was pretty late in the year so most of the ice had melted um, but I imagine that this little ice formation was pretty uh, quite the spectacle earlier in the year uh, there were also a ton of fossilized bones, as well as some claws um, throughout the cave. Uh, and then you can see by the thumb there, there's, there's the fossilized orange bones. They were all over in this cave. And our final find of the year, which Zach was actually not present for, uh, we had two, so there's three of our cave crew members and we are kind of staggered so that uh, we left at different times. Uh, this was after Zach had left, so it was just Penelope and I ridge walking, and we stumbled upon Paintbox Cave. Uh, and it had some pretty cool formations in it, just dog tooth spar formations. 
Uh, it also, on some of the dog tooth spar, there's these red markings, um, which appear to be placed onto the formation, not a part of the formation, not like the coloration of the formation. Uh, so perhaps it could be some uh, native art of some sort. Uh, but they were on a lot of the formations, just little red spots. Uh, yeah, and so a lot of holes. We saw so many promising holes that did not go anywhere. So what happened to all the data we got? Uh, so BLM has a database um, on ArcGIS. Uh, so there's a screenshot to the right there. Uh, and they just basically have points for all the caves. And then if you click on the point, it'll bring up information about it. Uh, and then we wrote a trip report about most of the finds or most of the significant finds, what we felt were significant. Um, I think at the end of the year, I ended up writing 54 short trip reports. Um, about the more significant features we found. Um, and then five of those we actually nominated for significance. Uh, so that's a, a piece of paper that, or a, a paperwork, I guess, that the Forest Service has that I filled out at the end of the year. Well, I guess Penelope helped. Um, and we submit it, and then it has to get signed by the forest supervisor, uh, and that cave becomes significant. Uh, so these are the seven criteria and essentially these criteria were put in place so that any karst feature could be nominated significant uh, because there's such a broad range of criteria. Um, so after, oh, I did not mean to. So yeah, the first is biota. So just any life that's pretty self, most of these are pretty self-explanatory, um, but things like recreation, scientific uh, slash educational, those, those two in particular, uh, you could really stretch a lot of detail or a lot of, uh, you, you could make any karst feature into a significant karst feature um, by saying that it has seg scientific significance um, or it could be some kind of recreation um, attraction. It also, a lot of the BLM land at least is has a wilderness designation on it currently. It's a wilderness study area. So it's an area which they designated to become wilderness eventually, essentially. Um, and so a lot of the caves were in those. And I, it, at the end of the year, Dan and I were discussing it, but I believe that every karst feature we found within those areas, because of this number seven here, because it lies within a specially designated area, um, is a significant karst feature. <clears throat> so what does that mean? It means it's protected. Um, <laughs> we may have been the only people to ever visit some of these. Uh, I'm sure. It, one or two humans have stumbled in many of them, but there, a lot of them are in pretty, pretty uh, interesting, hard to get to places. Um, but they are protected by law if they become significant. Um, if they're significant enough and people are going to visit them, we may add a NMRG register. Uh, with Cliff Cave, we produced a map, and I do plan on going back and mapping the other four that we nominated for significance. Um, and then if there was a find that was large enough, uh, the Cave Club made me may be recruited to monitor and come up with a management plan for that cave. Uh, there's a significant cave that I'm sure you've all have visited. Uh, we didn't only look for caves. We also helped put up some signs. Uh, Penelope and I went down and helped find the tallest petrified tree in the world. Uh, Self-proclaimed, but I guess it is. Um, and that's just outside of Yellowstone. We also did several monitoring visits. So we visited Mystery Cave, Red Prior Ice Cave, Big Ice Cave, Four Year Bat Cave, and Royce Cave. Um, and what we did there was you just gathered the register. Uh, we recorded who had visited the cave in the last, uh, well, for most of them, it was the entire, since the register had been put there, who had visited the cave. Um, and then we wrote sh just short trip reports about vandalism, about the state of the cave, about uh, any formations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of the year, we also began surveying Red Lodge Creek Cave, uh, the uh, Big Fort Cave Club, High School Cave Club is going to do some monitoring on it. And to our knowledge, there isn't a map of it. Although I may, I've 
I've heard rumors that, uh, of, that there might be a map, but as far as Dan and I knew, there wasn't a map. So we started surveying it. Um, so that was kind of the end of the year project. And there's several volunteers from the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto who helped us out with that. Some of us in front of, uh, there's 300, about 300 feet of passage so far. And the last trip, I actually left my survey book in the entrance where it still lays. So I have not finished the map yet, but soon to be finished. So there will be a 2020 cave crew. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not sure if the coronavirus has changed that or not, but uh, there should be. Um, and we do take, last year we had several people come out and volunteer. They helped uh, survey Red, Red Lodge Creek Cave. They also just helped us ridge walk. Um, it's really nice when you're with the same three people all summer hiking around to have some new faces. So I encourage you this year to get in contact with Dan or the cave crew um, and go volunteer and ridge walk with them. And maybe next year they will find the big system that lays deep within the priors. Uh, and that's all I have. So I will gladly answer any questions and